Okay, this is called uh, wireless technology because it's right here in front of me. I don't have to connect any wires up. And I think I'll back up just a little bit. Yeah, I just need to put that there. Uh, so, First Peter, right? oh no, we're in Romans. That's right. <laughs> first, first Romans. First Romans, yeah. Just don't teach sacrifice. Okay. So try not to. <clears throat> so, some of you know I have animals, and you know, before I come, the first, the last thing I do before I leave my property is I go feed the cows and everything, and uh, ooh, extra. Thank you. A couple. A couple. Yeah. Need to add one of those. Um, so, I. I don't know what I'm going to wear until that morning I get up and I go to my closet and I go to the back and pick out the last pair of pants that are in there. White pants? Day? <laughs> of all days? White pants? But I did uh, the tie. I was thinking of John because, you know, he he's, has this collection of ties and I don't know if he has one. This tie has a zipper. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. It's actually, it, it, it zips up and down. Wow. Yeah. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm going to have to steal that. It's one of those ties that you almost never wear because I got this for my, uh, my youngest son, who was the first one of my four kids that got married, but his wedding. We bought those for his wedding, and I've never worn it any other time. So, notes for Romans 4. Romans, a very interesting book. Uh, we enjoyed the studies. It, it's, it's interesting because it's, it seems to be really useful for those of us that are te teaching because you have to study it, and boy, there's a lot of stuff in here. But one of the things that has always struck me with Romans is as you're reading through it it seems a little repetitive you know well didn't we get that in the other chapter but as you read through the different chapters in Romans you'll find that it may seem repetitive but Paul keeps adding a little nuance to it and chapter 4 there's a bit of a change and so I, I'm hoping that I'll point that out and hopefully that'll be of interest to you. Um, so <clears throat> the lead off question, verse one, chapter four, what shall we say then? So this is kind of a summary question. It, it's kind of like saying, okay, so where are we? What, where, what, what are we doing here? What are we talking about here in Romans? Um, and that kind of leads off with, okay, what have we covered up until now? And so just to pull out a few bullet points out of, you know, not to rehash too much, but starting in chapter 1, we have Paul's message to the Romans. And it starts with, he is separated unto the gospel of God. The whole book, his purpose, his goal is going to be about the gospel. And then it's not only the gospel, but the gospel of God and concerning His Son, Jesus Christ. This is going to be a key element of this whole book as we're going through here. It's the gospel, and we've heard, uh, some of us that have been around a little bit longer have heard about the Romans' road to salvation, and you can walk somebody through to salvation through through the book of Romans, and it's that's whole Paul's whole purpose. Oh, great. Technology. Yes, yes, I love technology when it times out. So Paul's whole purpose is the gospel in here, and concerning his son Jesus Christ, and the the thought there when. Uh, Peter and James and John went with the Lord Jesus up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter, you know, the usual shoot from the hip kind of guy, uh, 
let's build three tabernacles. Yeah, won't that be cool? And a cloud overshadows them. And the voice of God says, This is my beloved son. Hear him. God's focus for us is his son, Jesus Christ. Um, we read in, in John that the Lord Jesus himself said, No man comes to the Father but by me. I, and the first part of that is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this book of Romans, we need to be aware of Jesus Christ. This is a key person that's going to be used throughout the book. Now, the next thing that comes along is uh, in chapter 1, we have verse 18, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So, the gospel message, Jesus Christ, the wrath of God against sin. And then chapter 2, we get into, he's talking to Gentiles, and he says, Thou, oh man, you're inexcusable. You have violated God's law, God's requirements for your life. And then, because he's got Jews in his audience as well, and they're sitting there, ah, yeah, we're pretty good people. And we've got the law, and we've, we've had all these, you know, the temple and all these things. And he says, and you Jews, you're breaking the law as well. And you're dishonoring God. And so the conclusion there in chapter 3 we have both Jews and Gentiles. Verse 9, we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And then you have the righteousness of God. So we're all under sin, but the righteousness of God, is, by faith of Jesus Christ, applies to all both the Jews and the Gentiles. Everyone, we're under sin, but God has made a way of salvation. And we can have that righteousness through Jesus Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We read that verse, but the next part of it, it says, um, <clears throat> being justified freely. Verse, uh, chapter 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we've had this gospel message. This is an incredible gospel message. Sin that came in. The wrath of God against sin. And how we all were under that curse. And yet, God provided Jesus Christ and a salvation that brings us justified or innocent is another part of that uh, that definition freely and then as we kind of talked about this is you know where are we at um, in the end of chapter 3 verse 28 therefore we conclude we've come to a conclusion there that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law what a blessed position to be in. So, you listen to that, and that's just the first three chapters. Romans is more than just three chapters long. But that's just the first three chapters. What more do you need? I mean, isn't that a blessed position? That it, we, This is just amazing. How are we going to top that? What, what's Paul going to add to that? Well, let's take a look at this and see because I think there's something more here. So verses 1 through 4 uh, of chapter 4, it talks about um, what shall we say that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found. And that phrase there I thought was a little... In the English, in your Bibles, there's commas. In the original, there ain't no commas there. <clears throat> so how do you read that? And so one way is, you know, what do we say that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, hath found? 
well, that would say basically physical, physically descended from, from Abraham. Well, who would that be? That would be just the Jews. But <clears throat> what's the context that we're talking about here? And the context, you get into verse 2 about Abraham being justified by works. So really, that first verse as pertaining to the flesh is not so much about the Jews. It's about Abraham in the flesh. Equivalence of works. It's basically they're talking about what did Abraham do? What did he physically do according to the flesh? So Abraham, <clears throat> it says, if he were justified by works, if he was a good guy, he did really good things, he'd have something to glory within. But it says, not before God. Why does it say that? And if you go down, kind of stepping down a little bit ahead, and then we'll come back, the end of verse, or verse 4. Now unto him that works, the reward is reckoned of grace, is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay, if you work for your salvation, then, doesn't it make sense? Hey, God, you owe me. I was a good guy. I did good things. Now, what are you going to do for me? Um, this life that we are living, it's not, it's not a matter of, it, it's not uh, the game show, let's make a deal here. God has laid out what things are like. And there's a, another passage in Matthew. I was reading the other day. There's a marriage supper. A king that made a supper for his son's marriage. And he invited all these people. And they made up excuses. You know, one had he bought some land, but he hadn't even seen it. He, another guy bought some, some cows, but he had never tried them out. So, you know, they made all kinds of lousy excuses. And they finally had to go out and invite anybody that they found. You know, go along the freeway and the off-ramps and, and grab people and bring them into this marriage supper. But one of the things that they did back in those marriage days, talking about marriage clothes, they gave you a garment. They said, here, put this on. You're in. You're in the marriage supper. Great. And then the king comes in and he sees somebody there. He says, hey, Where's your garment? You don't have a garment on. Why are you here? It says the man was speechless. People that think that they're going to make a deal with God, you find there, there's nothing to say. You have nothing to say. You come to God on the basis of your works. There's nothing there. You have no argument. Nothing at all to say. You'll be speechless. So, we get to this verse 3, and this is an interesting thing. It says, Scripture says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Well, didn't Abraham do something? God told him, I need you to leave your town and go. I'm going to tell you where, but just go. You read in the Bible, he says he packed up his stuff and he moved to Beverly. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he left Ur. What does this verse say? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. His leaving Ur, the Chaldees, was not what was counted as righteousness. The fact that God told him something and he believed what God said. That is what was counted for righteousness. So there's again that whole thought of it's faith and trust in what God says. Not our actions, not what we do. So again that verse 4, <clears throat> it's not reckoned of grace, but of debt, if you try to work your way in. But we're talking about 
We want it to be reckoned by grace. Now, here's where there's a change, a little bit of a change, and it's a detail that it's easy to pass over. Verse 4, Now unto him that worketh is the reward. Oh, okay. We talked the first three chapters with the gospel and freedom from the guilt of sin. Now he says, there's more. There's a reward. Wow. Um, the word there uh, for reward is misthos. Hoping I pronounce that right. But the thought is payment for services or wages. Hmm. Is there any other verse that we know of that uses that term? The rages of sin is death. But, and now the word that we have here, reward, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's trying to bring us to the next step. Yes, we have sinned, we were all under sin. But what does he want us to do? Okay, that's great. It's dealt with. Where sins are washed away at the blood of the cross. But that's not it. That's not the end. This grace, this is the key point. This grace that we're talking about, it's not just forgiveness of sins. There's a whole lot more that goes along with it. And Paul we're inching our way through Romans and inching our way into the thoughts that he's giving us here that we need to look for more. Now, verse 5, this faith that's counted for righteousness, uh, the word there, uh, believed on him that justifieth the ungodly. Uh, justifieth, I, <clears throat> I looked that one up, and when I was homeschooling our two youngest uh, we had we were a part of Christian Heritage School here there was another one in uh, 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 what was the other name anyway there was a group out in San Bernardino and their homeschool group was called Decaios so they were you know yeah we're more spiritual um, <laughs> so that was the name of their homeschool group and Decaios means uh, righteous but the word here justifieth it's to see as righteous so that's an interesting thought there that part of this salvation it's not just a matter of getting rid of the sin but now we are seen as righteous and another part word of the definition there is innocent so regardless of what we have done, we've now been brought into this position of righteousness, seen as righteous. And that's, if you're looking at different doctrines, the doctrine of our standing before God. This is where we get that, that God has brought us not just free from sin, but now in a position of innocence and righteous standing before God. Verse 6, we have God imputing, and I think uh, John talked about this word last time. The word impute, not a common word that we use, but the idea there is taking inventory, reckoning, or counting. So he's imputing. God's putting on our account, taking inventory of Joe Ruga and saying, I don't find anything. There's nothing there. You're innocent. Wow. That's an amazing step. That we are now seen before God in that way. Verse 7 gets us into the completeness of this salvation by talking about iniquity and sin. And so this is a sad illustration, but it's the best one I could think of. Iniquities are forgiven. Iniquity 
means the violation of the law. So if you pull up to an intersection and it has a left turn lane and you have a signal and it's red, what do you do? You stop, wait for it to turn green. If I pull up to an intersection, I see a red thing and I turn, I have violated the law. Didn't hurt anybody. I got where I was going to go. I was fine. But it was an iniquity. It was a violation of the law. Now, somebody's walking in the crosswalk that way, and I turn left on a red light, and I run them over. Okay, there's the sin. Sins are covered. The offense, the actual offense. I killed somebody. So it falls short on a couple of levels, but the idea there is there is a breaking of the law, but then there's the results of breaking the law. And so both are completely taken away. The blood of Christ removes all of that. But the first word in that sentence is blessed. Or if you like the Old Testament readings, blessed. Um, blessed. Makari, makarios. Makarios. The word there isn't just a matter of, yeah, this is a good thing, but it is supremely blessed. The blessings that we have, because our sins are forgiven and our iniquities are forgiven, our sins are covered, we have been brought into that place of righteousness and we are supremely blessed, happy, well off. We have completely been removed from the, the problems of this life and that's the where we, sh we should be. So that blessing, understanding that blessing that we come into. Now, the uh, verse 8, again, we have the blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It's kind of the opposite of what we had in verse 3 where Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness or counted unto him for righteousness. This is kind of the opposite. God will not impute sin. So this is an amazing thing. He's not only taking care of all of our sins, but new sins, because we do, he doesn't count against us. He is not we blessed is the man we have that supremely blessed because god doesn't count our sin against us that's an amazing position now that doesn't eliminate the bema seat of christ where we still have the wood the hay the stubble that will be burnt up sin will always always be dealt with by god either at the blood of the cross or these other sins, wood, hay, stubble, they'll be consumed. They're going to be taken away. But our standing, your standing before God, nothing is going to touch that. Because it's not dependent upon you. It's not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon God's provisions. That's a blessed place. So, in, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try and fly through the rest of this here. Prior to being a nation of Israel, the Jewish people, verses 9 and 10, there's this talk about the circumcision and whether this is just for the Israelites or it applies to the Gentiles. And showing here that the Abraham and the, that God was dealing with Abraham before there was a Jewish people, before they had the circumcision came in. So all of that, it talks in verse 11 about Abraham being the father of all of them that believe. And you kind of, okay, I get that. In verse 12, yeah, um, everyone that walks in the steps that has the same faith as Abraham will be one of Abraham's seed. And it, yeah, okay. So, big deal. Why? Why does God do that? Get into verse 13. 
for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. God made a promise to Abraham. And because of all what we just talked about, where Abraham is the father of all of those that believe, not just the Jews, but of the Gentiles as well, anyone that walks in that faith, we become the beneficiaries of the promise that was made to Abraham. So now, just adding on top of free from sin, now we're righteous standing before God, now there's a reward, eternal life, and now there's a promise that God has made to Abraham. The promise there, the word, means the announcement of divine assurance of good. God has promised good to us. God has made a promise to Abraham, and we are now, and the next word that's in there, heirs. Heirs of that promise. That heir is a sharer. In the, in the a share by lot, but there's another sense that goes along with that word heir, and it's a possessor. So this is not something that we say, yep, someday it's going to happen. I, uh, you know, I don't know. Right now, today, you and I, because of what the Lord Jesus has done and God's provision of God's grace. We are possessors of that promise and the results of that promise. Then, but through the righteousness of faith, and the faith there, that word means persuasion, moral conviction, especially in Christ for salvation. But there's an added part to that. And it's and cons constancy in such profession, profession. So it's not just a matter of uh, trust now and, and walk away from it. But having that faith, walking in the steps of faith. So for us today, that's part of our life, is walking in the steps of faith that Abraham had. So uh, verse 14, where you have, if you try to do it by works, then you've made void the promise. How many times have you gotten stuff in the mail about, oh, there's a really great deal on cars down there? If this, you read the fine print and you find, oh, that's a great deal, but it, it doesn't apply to me. It's nothing I'm going to do with it. Um, but here, that's if you try to make yourself right before God through works. But if it's of faith, verse 16, it, it's of faith, God has made it this way so that that promise might be sure. God has made sure that that promise is going to apply to us. Nothing left to chance. Nothing left to us to do. God takes care of all of that. Now verse 17, I just really like this verse. It's so cool. It says, God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You know, we look forward and, and I can say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm planning on doing something, but I, you know, it may not end up being what I planned. Here, God is saying, I've made this promise these things I can tell you for sure as, as if it was already in place. If we were, as if we were already in glory, our standing before God is absolutely sure. <clears throat> We've been made, uh, and verse 17, the other part of it is, who quickeneth the dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins, 
but we've been made alive in Christ. So the idea there that as a natural man in under sin, they're standing before God as you're dead. But here God has said, no, I'm giving you life, life eternal, life abundant life. This is something that we have in Christ. Um, verse 18, uh, Abraham hoping against hope. Now, this next section is a practical example from Abraham's life of something that was literally impossible. He was too old to have kids. Sarah was too old to have kids. And what did Abraham do? He believed God. He trusted in God's word. He was not, in verse 19, weak in faith. He did not, in verse 20, he didn't stagger at the promise of God. But he was strong in faith. And verse 21, what a blessed verse, being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able also to perform. So the rest here, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and it wasn't just for his sake, for Abraham's sake, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, that it's been imputed to us. That's the faith, when we have that faith in Christ, with faith in what God's word has said, imputing to us that righteous standing before God, that, who, uh, that our Lord Jesus Christ, when we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. There's a verse in... I think it's Hebrews, talks in the negative sense. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Mm -hmm. But to uh, focus on what he's giving us here in this fourth chapter of Romans, he's expanding on salvation. So great a salvation. Salvation beyond anything that we would think. Beyond what we're capable of really understanding. That's the salvation that we have. So Paul walking us through Romans here. Let's watch some of the details. Watch some of these minor key words that are in there. And see how Paul's going to continue through the book to open up and, and bless us with a under, better understanding of how great a salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Let's go ahead and close. Our God and Father, how thankful we are that we are not left to stand before Thee on our own. But we have an advocate, the one who has paid the price for our sins who has redeemed us with his own blood, thine own precious Son, Jesus Christ. So we do just thank thee for this word that we've had before us. Pray that it would be a blessing and help encourage us each to remember how great a salvation that we have been given. And we just praise thee and thank thee. Commit ourselves to thee for the rest of the day and this following week. And we thank thee in thy name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.